A little earlier I caught up with the Justice Secretary and Vote Leave campaigner Michael Gove and I started by asking him that cap on net migration, reducing it to the tens of thousands, is it for him a hard and fast pledge to voters? And if they vote for Brexit, will they get that cap? I think it's for the country to decide after we voted to leave what it thinks is appropriate. No. Ah, so it could be appropriate to go above the 100,000 cap? If, if that's what the country decides, yes. And is that more or less where you are? Because it's only in February that you said uh, when you were asked uh, that you're not, uh, it's not a matter of numbers for me. That was February, it's not very long ago. You don't particularly mind where uh, migration levels are, do you? Well, I, I think it's important that they have public consent and so approval you, and support. So you actually think that it is perfectly possible, let's say businesses turn around and say, actually, this is a disaster, we're not getting enough people, there's a lot of growth happening in the economy, we need, say, 200,000, 300,000 net migration, uh, you'd support that? You don't simply allow business to dictate exactly who's saying they're dictating it, you listen to them, don't you? Well, I think the, the critical thing is that we need to be in a position where we can have an open debate where politicians, if they make promises, honour them, and where we can control numbers overall. But and I think, think you're giving a lot of people who are marching behind you uh, in this campaign the impression that bingo, the drawbridge is coming up, the door is being shut. Those are the phrases they use, and you must have heard them. But in reality, you don't think that would necessarily happen, well, do you? I think the biggest problem that we have is that public support for migration has um, been compromised because promises have been made that uh, we cannot honour while we're in the European Union. In an ideal world, I don't think um, um, migration should be um, an issue of political contention. I hope it would be an area of political consensus. On the immigration topic, uh, you were asked on Sunday uh, your reaction to that poster, uh, the Farage poster. You said you shuddered when you saw that poster. Yes, I did. You said. That, that's a very quiet, sort of private reaction. Some people immediately publicised their distaste. Yes. Some people had different reactions. You didn't. You shuddered in private and then on Sunday when asked said, I shuddered. Do you regret that? Do you think you actually, you probably should have spoken out earlier about that, if it's that offensive to you? Well, um, uh, without going through the, the circumstances of the day that the poster was um, released, whenever I've been asked my opinion about uh, any aspect of this campaign, um, I hope that I've given um, a fair and, and measured response. Well, some people would say, and they're sometimes people that uh, you're still in government with, um, that they shuddered when they saw some of your posters and that mm. you've been in the slipstream. This is the one on Turkey, yes. uh, which has been put up all over the country. You've been in the slipstream of Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage says you're on his agenda. I, I don't accept that. I, I'd say two things. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing is that it's undoubtedly the case that migration is an issue of public concern. And, and we don't choose the topics that the public raise with us in a debate like this. I've been on audience... I think you do. You've just blocked well, a whole load of poster signs. I, I've, I've been on programmes um, which have been organised by uh, Sky and the BBC. And I don't screen or vet the questions. I respond to those questions. And it's been striking the feelings that people have in this country about migration. I think those feelings need to be sympathetically addressed rather than dismissed. One of the arguments, again, that your opponents make is that one of the reasons you've moved on to immigration is because you weren't, uh, weren't really cutting it on the economic arguments. It seems to be your contention that if the country votes to leave the European Union, the 27 other countries, they'll just shrug their shoulders and say, let's make a comfy little deal for Britain, even if it makes it look enticing for all these other countries that might just do a breakaway. Well, I think that um, it will be the case if we vote to leave, that it will be absolutely a rebuke and a check to European political leaders who've treated um, uh, every failure as a reason only to redouble integration. So I think that um, actually, if we vote to leave, what it will do is act as a wake-up call to many of these leaders. You've talked about hoping that if the country votes for Brexit, there will be a contagion of the democratic spirit yes. uh, across Europe. Because it looks to me as though it means somehow the project ending, perhaps with a few others um, breaking out and then you know, drawing a halt to the whole thing. Uh, I, think, I think it requires a period of reflection on Europe's political leaders. This is a major thing. This is the European Union project, and you're hoping that somehow 
it isn't there in its current form. It changes. What sort of impact assessment have you done on how that would affect Britain? Because this is a very, very serious matter. Uh, I, think, I th presume you've done a very considered one. I think it would undoubtedly... It's a big thing. Uh, it, it is a big thing. But I think that it would undoubtedly benefit Britain if the European Union were in a stronger economic, political and cultural position. I think we're taking that as no impact assessment. I mean, you're just hoping it happens and let's, well, see, what, let's, let's see what follows. Well, I think that uh, we know that if we remain in the European Union and we vote to remain, that the European Union will continue down the disastrous path that it's followed um, in the last 10 years. We know that the, the single currency, this job-destroying machine, um, won't be um, reviewed and lessons won't be learned. Instead, they will simply double down on misery. Why do you think there isn't a governing leader of a country that wishes us well, that agrees with you ab about Brexit? There are many, many politicians in countries that do wish us well, Australia, Canada, ones been thrown out uh, New Zealand and America. Ones who are retired. Um, they are, yes, they are people who, uh, as a result of their experience of the world, um, are now free to speak out, unconstrained by the, uh, the rules of international good manners, which, which mean that, um, that sitting prime ministers and presidents don't criticise other prime ministers or presidents when they're having an internal referendum. Which leaders of which European parties do you think would be opening champagne on Friday morning, if you've won, um, I uh, I know the route that you're trying to take me down, um, and I would say it's not that a pretty one, is it? You can picture the scene. You, well, one of the things that I would the say leaders is that of the far right populist parties will be popping champagne, and you well, know it. No, I think one of the critical things about the far right populist parties is that uh, they have grown in strength as a result of the failure of the European Union to provide jobs and prosperity and for their people. And this will be a shot in the arm. This will be no, adrenaline. No, I actually think one of the most effective ways that we can deal with far right populism in this country and across the European Union is by restoring democratic self-government. Throughout this campaign, uh, either David Cameron and George Osborne have been lying, or you and Boris Johnson have been lying. Which is it? We disagree. Um, and I think in no, politics... No, you're, you're pointing and accusing each other of, of, of no, lying. No. Or you could both be lying, of course. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, people will make their own mind up about the arguments and the quality of arguments that I and others have made. I've been, I hope, clear throughout whenever I've had an opportunity to say so that I think the Prime Minister is an outstanding leader of this country <laughs> and the <laughs> Chancellor has been then fantastic. You, then you say a whole load of things that completely undermine well, it. Well, on one issue. I think they think you're speaking from two different faces. I think that um, when you have the opportunity in a referendum, as the Prime Minister enjoined on us, to follow your heart, that's what I, I felt that I had to do. And I, I feel strongly that Britain would be uh, a freer, fairer and better off country if we left the European Union. And I have had the opportunity in this referendum, thanks to the Prime Minister's generosity of spirit, to explain why. Um, this is the only issue where I disagree with him. I disagree with him, of course, deeply on it, but it's the only issue. And it's an issue that also um, uh, leads to, not division, but to disagreement in families and among friends and in workplaces across the country. But that doesn't mean after we voted on Thursday, that we can't, uh, as a country, come back together and whatever the vote, I hope obviously that it's a vote to leave, ensure that um, the virtues that have made this country so special in the past continue to characterise us in the future.